Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast. I'm Matt Forte, and we have a great guest today, my first guest. And I could have no one other than this dude on. He is a first-round draft pick in the 2004 NFL Draft. He's a tight end that played at Georgia, played in a couple of Super Bowls. One one has a ring. I don't. So this dude is amazing. He's a husband, a father, a believer in Jesus Christ, but also a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I want to introduce you guys to Benjamin Watson. What's up, Ben? What's up, man? Hey, good to be with you, man. Congratulations. You know, doing it big now. I'm honored to be on here with you, somebody as illustrious as yourself. Yeah, you you like my big brother, so I, I'm just trying to be like you. You know, <laughs> Go we ahead, got man. I I, uh, I I introduced you with the first round draft pick, and then you know I didn't quite get the first round. I got the second round. We we talked about the Super Bowl appearances. I got to the NFC Championship, not quite the so like you're my big brother. I'm I'm always trying to get where you are. He's also also an author. Ben, you wrote books while playing football in the NFL. Like, how does one do that? Well, well, this is the thing, though. This, this is this is where you know I I'm going to share a, a bit about you because I played for four years in New Orleans with the Saints, and so th- there's a legend of Matt Forte in, in the state of Louisiana, and so you, you would have been able to like you know sell me on that oh what was me stuff, but I lived in Louisiana and and, and I was by Tulane. And I knew people that knew you and knew of you. And you say the name Matt Forte in the state of Louisiana, man. People are going to have a tear come down their eye. But uh, congratulations oh, to you as well on, uh, on the release of, of your book, man. You know, as you Thank know, you. Uh, writing books is, um, man, it's, it's an expression of yourself, you mm-hmm. know. And, and I think that it's crazy. You know, you play for a long time in the league. And, you know, sometimes people ask about, you know, how, how it's different being out. But I tell you, while, while I was in football, it was it was easier sometimes to write yeah. because you had uh, more of a set schedule during the season. Then you had the off season. The the one book that I wrote, um, the New Dad's Playbook, I wrote that while I was injured. Most of it while I was injured with an Achilles. And okay. So I was out for the year. Me and my uh, daughter, my youngest daughter at the time, spent a lot of time together, and uh, and that was a pocket of time where I wrote that book. But it was crazy if you get out of the league. I feel like stuff is even more hectic because yeah. there's all these different opportunities and the schedule is not as set. Yeah, we and we're going to talk about that later because uh, you got the tribe of Benjamin over there. You got a <laughs> bunch of kids. I'm not even going to say how many you got because I think it's like, what, we up to like 12 now or like? No, you think I'm Sean Alexander. <laughs> no. No, I know we, you got, we, you we got seven. We at seven. The number yeah. of completion and perfection. That's right. right. So that that's a wrap, right? That's a wrap, bro. I'm retired. Okay, I'm you retired. retired. I'm out the game. I'm out of the game unless, uh, you know, God does do things immaculately sometimes. That's right. So I'm not going to, you know, he's done it before. I'm not going to say he's going to do it again. You know, the Lord uh, said but, it be but, fruitful and, and multiply. So Kirsten got to stay away from you, man. <laughs> we, 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 we multiply. <laughs> <laughs> but, man, you, you've you written books on, on race, fatherhood, and abortion, like some major, like, heavy topics. Uh, how do you How do you deal with, um, not so much, like, I would say backlash or, you know, people because people are opinionated and everybody today, you know, in a in a culture that's very divisive, um, where unity isn't really promoted. How do you stand on your belief uh, in those things, like standing for, you know, life and then standing on, um, you know, unity and the equality of of race in this 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 country, given that the way that our country actually started and the history of it and stuff like that? It's, It's a heavy topic. So how do you uh, find yourself uh, staying solid on those without, you know, the chirp coming in from this person or that or this media outlet and that media outlet or or even fans that once were football fans. And now they're kind of critical of your your post career. Yeah, uh, I think that, um, you know, people people want to be liked. Um, they want to be respected. And but most of all, people just want to see people that are authentic. I mean, to be honest with you, I, I have more respect for people that I look at and say, I totally disagree with you, but you really believe what you believe and you think you're doing what's best for people than someone who lives an hour life of finish. And so I think for me, it's really about seeking a level of humility. Um, we all have a propensity to become pompous and to think that we know all the answers. 
the issues that you mentioned are are deep seated um, spiritual as well as social issues in our society, and uh, and they're things that need to be talked about. Uh, but what's been encouraging to me, honestly, Matt, is like, you know, I, I wrote a book, wrote some stuff about race and about the gospel and about abortion, all those sorts of things. And there's always people who say, you know, I, I don't I don't agree with you, but thank you for taking a stand on this and making me think yeah. like, like, like thank you for presenting an alternative viewpoint that might not be mainstream. But I can respect you because I know that you are sincere in what you're saying. and and there's no reason for me to believe that you're simply trying to insult people um, or lead people astray. And I think that that leads to these types of conversations. Like that, like that, that opens the door to you have engaging in a conversation with someone who thinks totally different from you on these important issues um, because they respect you. And so I, I, I've been fortunate. You know, I, I've had a lot of support on some of the things that I've said. I've had a lot of people say that I was an idiot. Um, it's OK. It comes with the territory. You know, but but what we are called to do, especially as believers, insofar as we can to align our viewpoints, political, social, behavioral, familial, um, within our marriages and our personal lives, we align that with what we see in the counsel of, of God in Scripture. And so yeah. that that's what that's what I'm responsible to ultimately. And and also, you know, when you look through Scripture and you see that the people a lot of times who are saying the truth. It didn't go well for them. <laughs> you know, Definitely they not. weren't honored. So so if you're getting a little bit of pushback, you might be on the right track. That's right. That's right. It takes incredible courage, man. So I want to commend you, first of all, for how you stand on what uh, you believe in and uh, and what the gospel says as well. Because, um, you know, like you, you mentioned uh, mainstream thought. And there's a lot. I mean, it's very easy to go mainstream. What has allowed you to, to steer away from that? in a life of professional sports where celebrityism and all this fame and money and things like that can, can block blur the vision or allow you or try to make you to go more mainstream where you do what everybody else is doing or what's cool. What's allowed you to be different. And the most frustrated person in life is a, is a Christian who's not living like it. The, the most frustrated person in life with someone who, who has a foot in both worlds and straddling the fence. And I've tried to straddle the fence. Like, I, I've tried to do some stuff that the world's doing and then do some stuff that I know that I should be doing. And you, you are a, a conflicted um, you know, person that is really crying out in anguish because you know the truth, but yet you're not trying to adhere to it. And, and within that, again, you know, I, I speak from a sense of, man, we have to be continually confessing and continually take an evaluation of our lives. But if we know the truth and we believe it, how can we not share? Like, how can we not devote ourselves to it? Um, it's, it's not hard to, to live for the Lord if you know that there's power in the gospel. That's and, right. that, and you know the truth of Scripture. It's not, it's not hard to do. Um, you may be lonely at times. You may feel um, inadequate to do it at times. You may feel like a hypocrite at times because you will be. <laughs> but when you know the truth, you can't run away from it. And, and also, you know this, like in the locker room, man, but one thing I miss about the game, and yeah, I'm sure you do too, is the conversation you have in the locker room with guys who are straddling the fence and guys who just need a little bit of encouragement that, hey, you know, it's okay to be a believer. Um, there are, you're not by yourself. There are more of you and it's contagious. It's like a fire. You see these fires that go around every single year. You talk about fires in different areas of the country. And it's amazing how many of them many times start with just a little, a little spark, a little wind on a dry day. And the next thing you know, there's this whole fire and you see it in locker rooms. You see it in workplaces. You see it in families. You see it in different communities, even churches. When there's someone that's willing to stand up for something that they all believe in, but they just need somebody to encourage them and be the leader in that respect. So, so as I would say, as my career started to, to wind down, it became even more important for me to talk about, you know, issues, not only social issues like race and abortion, those sorts of things, but just to, to talk about, man, you know, living as men, um, you know, following the Lord, leading our households, all those sorts of things that, that we as men 
that descendants of Adam push, away, push ourselves away from. Yeah. Just challenging people to do those things, it became more important because we, we, we need each other. And, you know, if not, if not me, then who? Yeah, that's true. I mean, you, you talked about the locker room. I mean, that's so true. You know, everybody, you probably hear that number one answer from guys who have played a long time or a short time and have retired or the game retired them. And they say, what do you miss most? And it's like, oh, it's the locker room. But for us, it was, it was different parts and pieces of the locker room. Obviously, um, I mean, I've heard from many guys who came from other teams that, you know, talked about Ben Watson. Like I remember him being in the, in the locker room. And when I, uh, I was, I was a first year, second year player. And I came in and he gave me a Bible. And I'm like, you know, the impact of that, like, you know, that's what a, a real man is. And that's what that's what pro ball is about. It's not really about the scoring touchdowns and trying to point, make it do it in a dance and point towards yourself to gain all the glory. Right. It's about impacting people's lives beyond football. And man, it, and, and you have done that as well. So um, now that you you find yourself you know, out of the locker room. Um, being a husband, a father, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if you're still in school, but I, I think you were in school yep, when you yeah, yep, yeah, still, still in school, still, still grinding away. Um, and then being a part of the media, you know, you're on SEC network and, and talking football. How do you find balance with all of those things on your plate? You were talking to the wrong person. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 well, I, I'd be, I'd be teeter tottering all over the place. Um, balance. I, you know, I had a, um, I had a teammate one time that talked about balance. Um, it was early, early, early in my career and, uh, we didn't even, we didn't have kids yet. Um, so it was early in my career. And I had a teammate that told me, look, when you get home, whenever you do have kids, but now that you're married, when you get home, you need to be husband, father. Don't bring work into, into your house because that's not the place for it. And that's not important there. And I didn't get it. It took me a while to figure that out. And what he was alluding to was this idea of, of balance. And it's not a balance of having different things in separate categories. It's a balance of being fully present wherever you are for that, for that task, wherever you are. And so when you are home, even for some guys, you know, they're, they're, they're just not home a lot. They work from, from seven to, to seven or whatever, and they get home to see the kids for a little bit. But when you're home, it's about being being present there. And that's been something that's been difficult for me. I carry a lot from a lot of different places. You know, it, I let stuff bleed over sometimes. But that one piece of advice I'm telling you, like like that, that to me illustrates what it means to have balance. It means that when you are home, you are a daddy, you are a husband. When you are at work, whatever your work is, you're the best worker that you can be. But you understand the priority and what's important. And when you leave that place, you leave it there. And too often, many of us carry things from disappointment or success or, or a claim that we get on the outside. We bring it into our home and it impacts our relationship with our wife and with our kids mm -hmm. where, you know, what he was trying to tell me was, no, you need to be. It's not about a balance. It's about being fully committed wherever you are. And then within that, I think sometimes for me, it's been about making proper decisions on what to say yes to or what to say no to. And that's been difficult. And you mentioned school. I'm in school. Um, I've been in there for a year, but there are some eight-week sessions where I have to step back and say, I can't do it. I feel like a failure because I'm dropping the class. Um, but it's smart of me to do that when I need to watch film to prepare for my job. <laughs> it's the network, yeah, right? So, yeah. so it's about making those types of decisions and saying, you know what? I can't be, I can't do everything. I need to say no in this season of life because, man, my kids are in three different sports and we're driving them and picking them up. And, and I know I can't be my best self doing this thing extra when I have to be here for this. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's nuggets of wisdom right there. So what you're saying is this, we often kind of think about balance as this juggling act, but when you're juggling, if you ever notice, or if you've ever juggled, you're not really focused on one of those balls or whatever you're, you're juggling you're kind of just there and you're like managing everything that just goes around so prioritizing is really the balance the focus or the key to balance and uh, or, and or I, like hate that present. Feeling. Mm -hmm. I hate that feeling of being observing a bunch of different things moving yeah. and not 
actually blocking out time for each one. I feel like when I, because I can juggle the most is, is three things at one time. Yeah. Um, and after it goes for a while, I start to get overwhelmed. And then yeah. sooner or later, I drop something. And I feel yeah. like that's what we think balance is, but it not necessarily is that. It's more prioritizing that. And so, um, you know, switching gears, you uh, you mentioned a teammate, you know, mentioning that to you. How was it playing? Because you played under some really good quarterbacks. Uh, you had Tom Brady as one, um, and you also had Drew Brees. Uh, how was it having those kind of leadership guys around who have, you know, there's a lot of talented guys in the NFL, but there's some dudes who have the intangibles. How was that being around quarterbacks like that? Man, there's, a, there's that old saying that, that, you know, great leaders or great players, great people make other people better. And it's true. Part of the reason why they make you better is because you don't want to let them down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like, like you, 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 they don't physically make you better. You still have to do the work on your own, but you don't want to disappoint them in the sense that you know all that they poured into I've, I've, you, you've been I've been around some guys that were main nameless um, some quarterbacks that I know didn't put the work in I mean you're a quarterback you gotta be there longer than me I play tight end like that's why they're paying you as much as they're paying you because you have to put in extra time you have to know everything that I don't even have to know and I know those guys weren't doing it and then you could see the rest of the team how that impacted them. and then you've got guys like I remember the first time I got to New Orleans, I walk in there on a Friday, um, you know, before Friday practice, which is a, a truncated day. But early in the morning, some guys get their lift out of the way. They still got one. I walk in there, it's dark in the in the field house there in New Orleans. And I see this this shadow, this figure out there on the field, like look like he was doing mimes or something. I know what the guy was doing. And the strength coach told me, yeah, that's Drew. He comes in here on Friday mornings and, and Saturday in the dark and goes through the entire offensive game plan and points to all of his receivers that he's going to go he goes through all his progression through the entire game and call to plays to himself yeah now i know a lot of other quarterbacks probably do stuff like that as well they sure do but to me that said man this guy is ultra prepared mentally physically emotionally so that he can be his best self every single sunday or monday or thursday game wherever it is for us and you see, you saw how the offense was great during those years. Same thing with, with, with Tom, you know, spending the extra time. Guys see that. And so I, 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 I gleaned a lot from them. And then the other thing that's encouraging is like, look, we can all be leaders in different ways. You got right. some guys who are rah rah, some guys who talk all the time. Mm -hmm. And then you got some guys who are the quiet, you know, counsel. They're steady. Um, they lead by example. And there's no one way to be the great leader. What, 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 the beauty of football is that you take all these guys and they have different characteristics. They have different uh, emotional states and, and they use those to the best of their ability to lead others. And it's the same way in our spiritual life. Um, so often we feel like we got to be somebody else. You know, I got to be Tony Evans. I got to be just like, I got to be like Dr. Yeah. Davis. You know, I got to be like this person or that person. And God's like, no. You be you, and you your your tendencies and your your emotional your emotions and your char your character use all that, and then I'll elevate it for my glory at a specific time. So, man, um, I tell my grandkids that I played with those two guys for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because I uh I, I used to watch uh when I was a rookie and I first came in, I realized that that was the 2006 uh Super Bowl defense. It was a lot of the same guys there for the Bears and a lot of them were perennial pro bowlers and mm -hmm. I was like I'm gonna watch every one of those dudes see what they do and they would be I come in they're there early I'm like oh, he beat me here what is he doing he's in the, why is he in the weight room we have a, we have a lift you know later on why is he already in the weight room and then why is he in the weight room after practice and he gets here and watch so I I would glean stuff from those guys as well um but you mentioned something that stuck out to me it was it was we didn't, you didn't want to let those guys down. And that's how they end up raising our standard. And how, do, how does that, I want to ask you, how does that relate to the gospel? Like how, how for someone who's uh, struggling with leadership in their own life, because I, I believe that if you don't have self-leadership, your leadership at some point in whatever else you do is going to fail if you don't even lead yourself correctly. Um, 
So how to, in our own life can we have that kind of relationship with Jesus where, man, I really, you know, there's a lot of believers who like maybe not look at it that way, where they don't raise their standard, where they look at when I do fall short, I'm letting Jesus down, letting God down. And if we did, maybe we wouldn't sin as much or we would stop some of the same stuff that we continue to go back to. Yeah, I, the the story that comes to mind um and we'll see how this relates is when Jesus watches the disciples' feet, feet, and and he, you know, it, it's the Last Supper as the story goes, and they're in the upper room, and Jesus knows what's about to happen. He knows he's about to be uh, betrayed, and he gets the basin, and he starts washing his disciples' feet, and the disciples, you know, are like, "No, Jesus, don't, don't wash, don't wash my feet." You know, that's no, I don't need you to wash my feet. And then when he says, "If I don't wash your feet, you won't." Uh, be part of me, then Peter's like, well, watch all of me, right? Watch everything. I want to be part of you. And, and from that, we think about the, the God of the universe, the maker of all things, the one whose blood was the propitiation for our sin, being willing to do a, a, a quote-unquote lowly act like washing someone's feet. And and when we think about how how prideful we can be as human beings, how prideful I can be, that things are beneath me, that people are beneath me, that certain um, acts of, of forgiveness um, are beneath me, that, man, I'm offended. No, you got to go through these hoops because I'm offended. And then you look at, at Jesus, who had every right to wipe everybody off the face of the earth because um, we all nailed him to the cross. And you see his selfless acts over and over again. And we say, man, if we're trying to be like him, then we got to take that too. You know, well, we have to take the the model of servant leadership and being willing to, in essence, lay down our lives for our spouses, for our children, lay down our pride when we get into uh, altercations with people, show them the love of Jesus in the way that we serve people. And that's what leadership really is about. And I think when you think about letting letting Jesus down, there's one way to look about it, look at it and say, okay, my sin cost his life. I don't want him to have died in vain, yeah. even though we know he didn't. I don't want it, it to, him to have died in vain because I keep on sinning. Paul says, because I have grace, should I keep sinning? No, I'm grateful that I have grace because he died for me. But the grace that I have is what makes me not want to sin anymore because I know the cost that was paid to provide that grace for me. And so as believers, two things, we, we, we don't want to sin because we don't want to abuse the grace of God. But we also learn how to live by looking at Christ's example as he was on his way to the cross to provide that grace. for. Me. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true, man. If we would be, I mean, the, the obedience part of it really shows that we understand grace and the grace that he has given us to give his life for uh, the atonement for our sins. And man, that, that is so, I mean, that, that is something that it needs to continue to be championed and spoken about by, especially everybody who has a, a platform, but us being particular um, athletes and former athletes, uh, why, especially in a culture and a climate today, is it so important for the athlete? It's kind of a two-part question. Why is it so important for the athlete right now, professional athlete, or anybody with a platform in general in sports, period, because it's kind of idolized when you get that platform. Why is it important to keep that message out there about that? And what do you say to the young player? Because we know this as well as being around them. There's a lot of them who may be in the locker rooms and they just are timid because they feel like I'm not adequate enough right now. I believe I've given my life to Christ, but I don't know if I could share the gospel with this guy because he's a veteran or if I don't know if I can really do it because I don't think I know enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's important because for every believer, whether they um, play football for a profession or um, whether they're a doctor, whether they don't have a job and they're an employee, every believer, no matter where you are, anywhere in this world, um, it's important for us to share the gospel because of the truth and the power in the gospel. Um, so, so that's number one. But number two, when Jesus left Matthew 28, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you, though I am with you to the very end of the age. Um, 
there's the truth in that statement because he said it, but too often we look at our um our human the human hierarchy that's set up and remove ourselves from that commandment because we're not at the type of a of a human created hierarchy. And as that relates to the athlete in the NFL, when you come in as a rookie, shut up, learn what to do. There's some truth to that. You need to do that as an athlete. That's shut good. up, learn what to do before you <laughs> before you're out of the league. But you also have to realize that 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 in the spiritual realm, you have more than enough to share to impact the lives of people who are veterans. You have more than enough by sharing what's in you through the Holy Spirit to challenge people to live a life. You have more than enough, man, to start an entire um, an, an entire redemption movement in your locker room and across your league. You know, some of the biggest movements were, were by young people. That's and right. so don't allow your position of being a backup or your position of being on a practice squad um, or your position of being cut and then brought back to, to impact how you let your light shine before men. Because whether you're the starter or not, we're supposed to let our light shine before men. Um, and it can be scary. I mean, the reality of it is that, that it's scary. It's scary for, for us sometimes when we know that our performance is tied to our profession. And we know that if we ruffle the wrong feathers and say the, say the wrong thing or offend the wrong person, especially on things like race, religion, politics, that we could be out the door. So we ought to be wise in how we do it, but we don't give up the responsibility or run away from the responsibility and the charge that Jesus gave the disciples way back in Matthew 28, because ultimately, we don't know how much time we got left. That's right. And we talk about the NFL being not for long. The truth of the matter is, it's not for long for all of us. And we can be lulled to sleep to feel like our, our career is going to be forever mm -hmm. or our life is going to be forever and nothing is promised. And far be it from us to, to, to wait till tomorrow to, to share or wait till tomorrow to encourage somebody or to live our faith with our platforms when, when tomorrow is not promised. And that, that's, that's a hard thing to wrestle with. Even as I say it, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to live for 15 more years, of course. But we don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's true. That's so true, man. We, we I mean, you, you play, I played 10, you played 15. And I don't know about for you, but for me, it went by so fast. So that decade of being in the league. And, um, you do often have that kind of, uh, facade of belief thinking that, man, you know, I can do this for, you know, forever. Like when I was in my seventh or eighth year, I was like, I think I got about 14, 15 years. And then, you know, you get older and them, those, those hits and stuff add up. It's like, <laughs> nah, I don't think I have much left in the, in the tank anymore. But, um, for the, and, and, this, and this is the other thing, this is the other thing, like don't underestimate your platform. Mm -hmm. Like there's been times in my life because we're always waiting for enough platform to say something. Like, uh, unless there are a few guys, I would say, man, they understand their platform. They're, they're perennial pro bowlers, whatever. They understand that their platform, but but all of us are always trying to gain more platform. Mm -hmm. We're trying to gain more visibility. It's like it's never. It's like money. It's never. Mm -hmm. And so if you're waiting until you get enough eyeballs and enough of the social media influence to say certain things, it's never going to be enough. But also, don't underestimate what you already do have. Don't underestimate how God can use that. I mean, so, some of the you know we talk about this book and writing books that happened when I wasn't a star. Okay. I wasn't even a star in New Orleans. I was playing behind who a guy I think probably one of the best tight ends ever to play, Jimmy Graham. Great guy, phenomenal athlete, like next level athlete. And I wasn't starting, and I was upset about it because my platform wasn't growing. And that's when that's when God decided to allow me to engage on this issue about race in America and write a book and and, and talk about it and be a commentator about it and and, and you know, engage with people and people's lives are, are, are moved. But I wasn't, I didn't have a platform then. So you just don't know. My goal, my hope is to try to walk in obedience no matter what season of, of life it is. And 
And that's difficult to do because, man, we live in a fame platform driven culture. That's just, that's just yeah. where we live. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned one thing that stuck out really broadly to me was the, the sacrifice of it. Um, you know, when we, when you stand on certain things and we say stuff in the locker room or if you like, you know, I'm going to share the gospel with this person, we think about the sacrifice, like what we, what we may lose. Like, man, if I talk about this in the locker room and the word gets out, I might get cut or I upset the wrong person. And when it comes down to it, you know, people don't have a heaven or a hell to put you into. And so we shouldn't really care about that, but we do. We often do because I think we don't understand the gain, the spiritual gain, the invisible that we can't see that, that treasures in heaven, that type of stuff, that gain. And what do you say to the young person or the young believer about, you know, embracing that sacrifice where you may not feel it now because it's not tangible where, man, I sacrificed all this summer and I gained this much speed or strength or this happened in the season. I had a great season. But when I share the gospel, I may be sacrificing a friendship or making a, someone mad or, or disagree with me. But what's the gain of that? You know, there's the scripture when Jesus talks about counting the call. And to the young person, I say, we've, we've done you a disservice. Um, believers, older believers, I call myself an older believer at this point, or middle-aged believer, maybe. Um, we've done you a disservice because we painted a picture of Christianity following Jesus that doesn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. And in life, in sports, everything has a cost. Like it costs you to get those jerseys behind you that are Pro Bowl jerseys, like that costs you. It costs you early mornings. It costs you injuries. It costs you pain, um, all those sorts of things. It costs you. It, it costs you to get a degree. You got to stay up and study. It, it costs my wife to birth seven kids. It costs her. But she got something beautiful at the end. It costs you to get fruit from a tree because you planted a seed and it grows and grows and grows. So there was a cost of labor and tilling the ground and planting that seed and watering it so that you get fruit. And it's the same thing. That's what Jesus was saying. is like, there's a cost of following you. The cost of following you, him, is death. We got to give up our life to gain it. And so when we understand the, the, the beauty of following Jesus from that perspective, then the possible cost of losing a friend who may come back to you in the end and say, thank you so much. Because it's happened to me where someone had said, I thought you were crazy. And then 10 years later, they're calling me saying, thank you for this Bible. Man, this Jesus person is amazing. Like, you know, 10 years later. Or, 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 or it may cost you your job. But like, if it does, it's hard as this is to say, do you not think that the God, is the God you're serving so weak that if it costs you your job, he can't give you another one? Mm -hmm. or maybe he doesn't want you to be there in the first place that's right and so like all the things i'm saying are things that i struggle with every single day battle every single day but to the young person like expect that there's going to be a, there's a cost for everything great anything great costs you something and if it takes the most from you do you not trust the person you place your faith in to replace or reload or retool something even better in place of what was given up. That's right. Amen. Amen. But man, uh, man, it's been so fun talking to you. You know, this time has gone by so fast. Uh, we got to get to some, some fun stuff to, to wrap it up. And I got my man, Jason Romano on here. He's got some, some facts. What's the fun facts that we got about Mr. Ben Watson? Oh, Ben, this was fun to dive into and find some fun facts about you. All right. Here's, here's the first fact. Uh, Ben Watson has two career rushing attempts. We're talking about Matt Forte, running back, right? So Ben Watson wow. has two career rushing attempts in his NFL career. One of them was for 11 yards against Cleveland in the undefeated regular season of 2007 that New England had. Um, what can you tell us, Ben Watson, about the 11-yard rush that you once had? Well, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, man, I do, I do remember two now. The other one I'm was minus one yard. We don't want to talk about minus that. Minus one? Yeah. So my average, so my average is like the... Uh, Five or so. Five, so. Hey, over two carries uh, over hard. 15 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I um, I, I remember it was, I think it was, it was like a, it was a tight end reverse. Had to be a tight end reverse. 
And I remember I came around the left side. I was like, oh, man, there's open space. I'm going to run for about 30 yards. And then they caught me in like 11. So uh, it was exhilarating. Like carrying the football was exhilarating. But I don't know that I want to do that like that every single play. <laughs> so, man, that average though, hey, if you if we're going by averages, yards per carry, <laughs> you you above me. You I'm like, up there. Yeah, you up there. Man. Yeah. I love that. Well, let me give you one more fun fact. October twenty first, twenty eighteen, Benjamin Watson caught Drew Brees' five hundredth career touchdown pass. It was a twenty four twenty three win over his former team, the Baltimore Ravens. What do you remember about that touchdown, Ben? Wait, wait, wait. First first did you keep the ball? Oh, there you go. I don't care if it's, it's his, you had to catch it, Great five, 500 or not. No, I did not keep the ball. Oh. I gave it to him, and he tried to tell me, no, you keep it, because that's the type of person he is. No, you keep it. I'm like, wow. Five, it's 500. I shoved it in his chest, like, you're keeping the ball. And I think it's in the, I think it must be in the Saints Hall of Fame now. But I remember leading up to that game, because this was a goal line play, and it was a, like a, like a wide, wide bow, you run to the corner of the end zone, and we get in goal line formation, they call the play. And we all knew leading up to this game that it was going to be probably going to be monumental because, you know, the league plans all this stuff. They know who's going to break the record, at what time, or what prime time game. And so we line up, and then the ball's in the air, he throws it. So I throw up a number five. At that point in time, we had five kids, and I always threw up a five for the kids. But it had a double meaning because it was like, oh, were you throwing that up for Drew Brees 500? I was like, yeah, it was for 500. Yeah, of course. Also from my 500, it was also for my five kids. <laughs> so, but he, he had he had that ball, but that was definitely a special day. And it was, you know, it was in Baltimore. I played there the year before. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. Well, thanks, Jason, for the uh, the fun facts about Ben. Man, I didn't realize he had a couple of rushing attempts. That's that's awesome. And then the, to catch the, the 500, I mean, that's, major milestones. You have some major milestones in your career. Um, so I'm going to ask you the question to, to close this out. This is the question I'm going to I ask every guest. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's pretty clear. It's obvious that Jesus Christ is first and foremost in your life. He is a priority, the priority. And uh, this question I want to ask is, is, why is that the priority, the number one priority in your life over marriage, over your kids, over everything in life, all these milestones and wonderful things that pro football has able uh, has allowed you to attain. Why is Jesus Christ being number one uh, in your life the best thing? Man, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I heard that verse from my father when I was about five or six years old. And I grew up in, in going to church, wrestled with some things, even as a young kid. And at that point in time in my life, I, I came, Jesus called me, the Spirit of God called me, and through repentance of faith, I put my, my trust in Him. And so at that point, the Bible says you're a new creation. And so for me, everything in life is ordered under or because of my, my faith. There's, there, there, there's no marriage without that. Like, there's no parenting without that. There's no life in the NFL. There's no life as a broadcaster. There's no doing advocacy work that I do. There's, there's, there's none of that stuff without um, that doesn't filter through the lens of of the God. You, you know, it, it's, it's my foundation. Um, everything else doesn't work. It seems like it works for a little while. And even as a believer, I've, I've coveted those things and tried to make my life work outside of that but nothing makes sense without it and so it truly is the power of god to salvation for those who have be- will believe in it, it, it gives me not only purpose but it gives me a uh, foundation and standing and it also gives me a uh, mission in a world that is ever ever changing that's good that's good well that we can't close it out any better than that, Jason and, and Ben. So, man, we thank you for your time. Uh, I know time is scarce because I only got four of them. You got seven. And I know you got to probably go to like a school pickup or practice or something this afternoon. So I want to let you get oh, straight, your time straight, in. Straight, straight Uber service in the afternoon. <laughs> like, dude, like, it's ridiculous. Hey, my, my oldest daughter is about to get her license uh, next year. And at first I was thinking, no, nah, you know, we'll drive. But no, nah, she, she needs to go. Like, yeah, yeah, you can help us yeah. out. It's time. 
<laughs> it's time. <laughs> well, man, blessings to you and Kirsten, man. We love you and uh, appreciate it, big bro. You've always been uh, one of the dudes I looked up to um, since we first met. I'm sad that we were never teammates, but we're brothers in no. Christ. We're on the same team now no. all the time. Amen. But, I but, know. Uh, but yeah, that's the Sports Spectrum Podcast. I'm Matt Forte and Jason Romano. I'm signing off.